Hey, so uh, before getting to the topic today, uh, I wanted to start with a bit of an aside uh, because this is kind of a sequel to a previous talk I gave, uh, also about Crate, uh, more than two years ago now, but at the same meetup. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to thank the organizers for continuously running this and building this coffin community here, and also for giving me that opportunity back then to speak, uh, which I believe was my first English talk ever. Um, and also like the opportunities since. Um, so let's get to uh, the actual topic, which is going to be CreateFeed Moshi. So today I'm going to talk about two, two libraries. And before we get into the meat of the talk and the technical stuff, I want to introduce both of these libraries briefly. I'm going to start with Create, which is one of my own open source libraries. Uh, this is an Android library that makes it easy to store values in share preferences. Let's look at what it looks like on the code level. So Crate is an interface, and it's a very simple interface. All it has is a share preferences property inside it. And the library also gives you a default implementation of Crate called Simple Crate. And uh, this takes a context as its parameter and just grabs the default share preferences from that context so that it's really easy to create your own Crate uh, without having to worry about implementing this property. So here's a crate example. You, know, you would take the context as the parameter to your own crate. You could pass it onto the simple crate base class. And then you could list different properties within your class and delegate each of them into functions provided by crate. And the magic here is that all of this is done with Kotlin's property delegation syntax. So whenever you create an instance of your crate and then read and write values uh, from and to it, um, you could do it just as if uh, these were regular booleans or ints or strings in memory, but under the hood, it, these would all get persisted into shared preferences and survive application restart and so on. So let's now take a look at how these functions can be implemented because we'll be implementing more of them later. I'll start with just a very simple example where we're going to store an int using create. And I'm going to simplify the client side code even more. Instead of using that function, I'm just going to delegate it into a very obvious in delegate instance. So this is going to be an instance of a class, and it's going to serve the uh, implementation of the property. So whenever you read or write the property, this class is going to do something. The class is going to get the key that it uses for storage as its parameter, and it's going to implement an interface called the read-write property. This is not mandatory when you're working with delegates, but I recommend doing it anyway because it makes it way easier to get the signatures of the following functions right. Uh, these are the two methods that are required by the interface. Get value is going to be called whenever you read the value of the property and set value whenever you write to it. The interface also has two generic type parameters. One of them you can use to control where this property may be used. By specifying crate here, I'm making sure that these properties will only ever be used inside of a crate. And as you can see here in the method signatures, I'm also going to get the current crate instance that the properties are in as the first parameter whenever someone gets or sets the value. And then the other property, uh, the other uh, type parameter of the interface is simply the type of property that we're implementing. So in this case, int. So we're going to have to return that from get value and receive it as a parameter in set value. With that, let's implement these using shared preferences. We can use the disref parameter, which is the crate, and grab the shared preferences of that, uh, because as you might recall, that's the only property that is defined on the crate interface. And then inside get value, we're using get int to get the int associated with the key. And in the set value function, we're starting an edit, putting in the value with the key, and then applying our changes, which is fairly straightforward. To make this syntax nicer and uh, slightly safer, uh, create also includes these intermediate functions. Uh, so uh, you get an int prep function, which is an extension on the create type. Uh, this makes sure that you can only call this when you're writing code inside of a create. And it's returning the interface type instead of the concrete class so that it's hiding the implementing class as a detail. Uh, remember, the read write property interface uh, comes from the standard library, so that's completely fine to expose. Um, so this would reduce and simplify our public API to just calling these functions, which are a bit nicer than creating class instances. That's a very brief, like, four-minute intro to create. Now let's do the same for Moshi, which is going to be like a five-minute intro, in case you haven't seen uh, this library yet. 
So Moshi is a serialization library, and it's JSON v3 in everything but name, uh, which is stolen from a Reddit comment by Jake Wharton. Um, Moshi is part of the OK group of libraries, so it integrates really nicely with other Square libraries, uh, Retrofit, OKHTTP, OK and OKIO, which you're likely using in Android applications for your networking needs anyway. And it's really efficient when you're using it combined with these other libraries. Uh, Moshi has a streaming API, which lets you do uh, parsing and serialization while uh, the uh, data is still coming in from the network. So that uh, like the costs of serialization and parsing are amortized uh, compared to the uh, network um, to the uh, network latency. And there's a talk about all of the like details of how these uh, libraries are interoperating and how they share buffers and why they are so performant, like six years ago, I believe, uh, by Jake Wharton. So if you're still not using Moshi, you should watch this talk and probably the performance explanations on, on their own will convince you to move to it. Moshi is also really aware of Kotlin, which is great. Uh, this is one of the huge problems with JSON, that it doesn't interpret Kotlin language features um, at all. Um, so for example, Moshi can handle nullable values. Uh, take this burger class, uh, which has a name in the description. Uh, if we then create a Moshi instance, uh, I'm just using the default builder with no configuration here, and then we grab an adapter to serialize or deserialize burgers. Uh, then I can uh, use the from JSON method to take a string and try to parse it into a burger. Uh, as you can see, my burger had two, two properties, but the JSON string that I'm using only has one of them specified. So Moshi in this case would recognize this. It would see that description is a required value and it would fail immediately uh, while parsing. JSON, for example, will just leave a null value in description, despite the type being non-nullable. Uh, so Moshi's like, fail-fast mechanisms are a uh, real lifesaver here. Uh, and it also gives us really nice diverted error messages. It tells us that it was a description that was missing and that the error occurred at the root of the object. We can also make this nullable, of course, uh, which Moshi will interpret as being optional. So if we try to parse the st same string again that doesn't have a description, then we're going to end up with an object which is valid, and it's just going to have null as the description, which is fine because the Kotlin compiler will force us to handle it anyway. Moshi can also do things like handle default parameter values. So if we were to, uh, instead of making it nullable, uh, just assume that all burgers, if we know nothing else about them, are yummy, then we could uh, put that into a default parameter. And if we parse the same string again that doesn't have a description, now we would end up with the default value in that property. Moshi can be set up with code gen, reflection, or a combination of both of them. Uh, I won't show you the Gradle configuration here. I have given a longer talk about Moshi last year. Uh, that will be in the references at the end of the talk that you can check out for more. Um, but the model object here is the code gen setup. That's why I have the JSON class annotation on it. And I'm specifying generated after true. Uh, this will, at compile time, create an adapter implementation that the default blank no configuration Moshi builder uh, will pick up and use automatically. Of course, I can also use reflection. Uh, that In that case, I can remove that annotation altogether and instead add the factory to my Moshi instance, which will tell it how to serialize and deserialize Kotlin-based classes using uh, Kotlin reflection. Uh, this brings in large dependencies, uh, like Kotlin reflect is not a lightweight thing, so you might want to avoid it. Uh, but you can also use both of them at the same time. So you can both add that factory and annotate some of your models to auto-generate adapters using CAPT. And in this case, for classes that have generated adapters, those will still be picked up and used. And for everything else, Morse is going to fall back to using reflection. Whichever approach you use, uh, it has some really nice properties uh, in how it works. For example, Moshi will always invoke constructors. So it will never create instances by just um, using Java's new instance API. Uh, it will always do constructor calls. So for example, if you were to do some side effects in your constructors, in your model objects, which you really shouldn't do in your DPOs, uh, but if you were to do it, they would still happen as you expect them to happen uh, because Moshi works nicely. And of course, as a last bonus point, uh, Moshi is named after a dog that Jake used to have. Uh, and there's a Twitter link here and a GitHub issue, so we can take a few seconds to appreciate that dog. All right, that's an intro to Crate and then to Moshi. Uh, let's now move on to storing complex data. So whenever you create a library that stores things, people are going to 
come to you with feature requests saying that they want to store more than ints and booleans. Uh, they want to do this great thing of taking data, serializing it into JSON, and putting that into shared preferences as a string. Uh, if you're an Android developer, you've probably done this at some point. And I do want to mention that this is not the best idea ever. Um, it's, it has its use cases. Um, I think it's valid in, in some use cases. But you have to be considerate about whether this JSON data might become too large to store like this, whether you might be better off with just a simple file, or whether you actually need a database because you want to query it, you want to index it, interpret it, filter things in it, and so on. Um, so this is not a solution for all data storage, uh, but people were, were asking for it in Crate, so I decided to add this support. And initially, I added JSON-based support for this uh, because I was still using JSON at the time, and that's what the requests were also about. So first, we're going to take a look at how that JSON-based approach worked because we can learn something from it. So um, the API is going to be the same as with storing an int, except now we have a generic function because we want to store some arbitrary type of model, which we're going to serialize into a string. And the method is, of course, an extension on create, and it's called JSONPref, and it takes a key that it will use for storage as a parameter, and we're returning an interface type, but we're going to have a private class that implements it. Uh, the class is going to look something like this. This also has to be generic. And just like before, it's going to have a get value and a set value method, which now have to return something of type T or accept something of type T. Inside get value, we can create a JSON instance, use that uh, to um, um, create a JSON instance, grab a string from shared preferences, and then use the JSON instance to parse that string back into our model using the JSON type token APIs to specify what type we want to get out of that string. And the other way around is very similar. We're creating a JSON instance. We're taking shared preferences, starting an edit, serializing using JSON, and uh, saving that string. Uh, this looks good on first glance. It definitely compiles, which is good. Um, but as soon as you start reading the values that you've stored back, you're going to start facing errors. Errors like this one, uh, where the error message is going to complain that it tried casting something called a linked tree map into your own custom model object, whatever it was. So the problem here is that whenever we read values back, uh, JSON is creating this very general JSON representation using lists and objects. Uh, lists and maps to uh, represent uh, JSON arrays and objects um, instead of using our own model that we want to parse. So it will have the right data, but it's not going to be the right type. Uh, why is this happening? Uh, the fault here is here, where we were trying to tell JSON what to parse from the string. Uh, JSON has this weird API for uh, specifying types uh, using type tokens. And the problem here is that we're using a generic type parameter inside this type token. Uh, the JVM has a great feature called type erasure, which means that at runtime, all generic types disappear. And you can essentially think of this as all of the type parameter references being replaced by just the object type. So in the bytecode, we don't have these generic types. We just have object everywhere. So we've managed to tell JSON that we want just an object parsed out of the string. And since that like um, construction of maps and lists that JSON creates in this case is an object because everything is. Um, JSON is happy returning that. How can we fix this? Uh, Kotlin can help us here. Um, it has this great feature called reified generics, which I won't dive too deeply into here. Uh, but the point is that if you mark a generic type parameter with the reified keyword, the actual real value of that type parameter will be available inside your code. Uh, this only works in inline functions because it's a compile time trick that uses inlining to work. Uh, but the point is that it does work and it will preserve the actual value of the T type parameter. Notably, we can't add this reified keyword to the class itself uh, because it only works with inline functions. So it's good that we're already using a factory function like this because this way we can create the type token inside that factory function when we still have the correct type information and then pass in that type value to the delegate class. OK, uh, this again compiles. And if you try writing and reading values, all of that seems to work now. But after this kind of trouble with uh, like intricacies of the type system and type erasure and the JVM and whatever, you really want to test your code. So let's see how we can go about testing these delegates. This is going to be surprisingly easy. Uh, we can create a model object. In this case, I have this uh, basic data class that has a couple different types of values in it. Then I create a test crate, which just uses simple crate again. 
And uh, I have two properties in here. One of them is just the model on its own. And the other is a list of models to also have a more complex test case. And both of them are, of course, uh, delegated into the JSON prep that we just created. Then for the test, I want to create an instance of this. So since this requires a context, I will either need to run this as an instrumented test or use RoboElectric. Or I could also mock the shared preferences APIs, um, but this is quite easy to do like this. And then the test is nearly trivial. I need to create an instance of my model. I want to put it in the crate, and then I want to assert that whenever I read it back, it's still the same model. Um, of course, in the meantime, it's going to get serialized into a string and then parsed back. And if I run this test, it will actually pass uh, with this current JSON implementation. And if I write a similar test for the other case where I have a list of these model values, I write that into the crate and read it back, that test will also pass. So we have a fully working implementation for JSON now. This uh, brings us all the way back to the beginning of the talk and the main topic, which is integrating crate with Moshi. So as time went by, it seemed like a very good idea to, uh, other than just supporting JSON, which is really, really not great in Kotlin and you shouldn't use it in a Kotlin-based project, to also add support for other serialization libraries, such as Moshi, which behaves much uh, nicer when you're using it with Kotlin. So let's see how we can implement a delegate that uses Moshi. So uh, to start with, I took my JSON-based module and I copy-pasted it within the project. Um, so we're just going to start with the JSON delegate and rewrite it to use Moshi because this is very simple. I'm going to rename the class. I'm going to change the implementation of get value so that instead of creating a JSON instance, it grabs a Moshi adapter and uses that to parse. And the same thing in set value. I'm going to grab an adapter from Moshi and use that to serialize into a string. And of course, I'm going to update the factory function as well so that it's called Moshi Pref and it uses this new Moshi delegate class. And that's pretty much it. Uh, this would work on its own um, and it would work correctly. But we ha do have the problem of using this type token. So type token is a class which comes from the JSON library. So this would mean, uh, using it here, uh, would mean that the Moshi-based implementation for Crate now depends on JSON, and you really don't want to pull in a whole other serialization library when it's not actually being used. You just need this type token thing from it. So this is uh, the core challenge that I faced when implementing this. I somehow had to figure out how to create a type that Moshi would later need uh, to grab the correct adapter from the reified T type parameter that I had in the factory function. And here, we're going to take a bit of a aside to take a look at um, types and classes and reflection things. I want to start by looking at class, as in the java.lang.class class, which is hard to talk about, but like try to stay with me here. Um, so class, if you look at this documentation, represents classes and interfaces in a running Java application. And you can get an instance of this in various ways. Uh, you can call it on any runtime object, and it will give you the class that it uh, is an instance of. You can also uh, do this in Kotlin by calling Java class on any runtime object. You can also do it on a type. So if you need the class that describes the string class, then you can do this. And you can uh, see a few examples here of calling it on various objects. So if you call it on a string, you get a a uh, class that describes the string class. If you call it an, an array list of strings, you get a class that just describes array list, which is important. And if you call it on an anonymous object like this blank serializable implementation here, then you're going to get the uh, descriptor of the generated class. Once you have that instance, you can do a bunch of things with it. Uh, for example, there are at least four different methods to grab its name, which will uh, give you the name in various forms depending on what you're inspecting. And you can also get a lot of uh, other reflection things uh, starting from a class. Uh, you can list the annotations that are on the class, the interfaces it implements, uh, all the fields and methods it has. You can call these by name. You can um, look up whether uh, they are private. You can make them accessible. This is the entry point for a lot of Java-based reflection things, um, which I'm not going to dive further into. Uh, but this is what class allows you to do in general. Then we have to look at another Java reflection type, which is type. Um, this is an interface, and according to the documentation, this is supposed to represent all types in the Java programming language. Uh, this is a newer thing in the JDK than class, uh, so it can describe more things. Uh, it can handle row types, but also parameterized types, type variables, and so on. 
the interface only has a single function, which is called the get type name. And this is not very interesting for us. What's a lot more interesting is the implementations that exist of the type interface. So for one, class also implements type. Um, so uh, this is uh, going to be one of the cases. And parameterized type is also another interface which implements type. And this lets you describe things like um, array list of strings correctly, which class wasn't able to do. So for example, if you uh, get a type that describes an array list of strings, then the row type function would uh, return the type that describes array list. And then the get actual type arguments uh, function would give you an array that would have the type uh, describing string inside of it. So these are the two options we have with Java-based reflection. Uh, to put it very, very simply, class does not handle generics, while type can handle parameterized types and generic types correctly. Of course, there are a lot of things in Kotlin that Java-based reflection APIs will not be able to describe for us. So Kotlin also has its own reflection utilities. For example, uh, there is a K class, which is the Kotlin version of class. And you can get this in very much the same way as you could get a class descriptor, like the Java class class. Um, you could use this double colon class syntax either on an object or on a type to get a K class instance. And then there are a lot of properties you can inspect there. Uh, again, there are different versions of the name, uh, the list of members, and so on. And also very Kotlin-specific things. For example, whether, um, for example, if this is a sealed class, you'll be able to find the whole list of the subclasses. Uh, or it has a visibility, which is actually a K visibility, uh, so that it's uh, able to describe things that don't exist in Java, like the internal visibility level in Kotlin. Also, a lot of Boolean things. You can check whether it's abstract, sealed, a data class, whether it's a companion object, or my favorite, whether it's fun or not. <laughs> you can always go from a K class back to a regular class uh, with this kind of syntax. So if you have a K class from somewhere, you can call the Java extension property on it, and that will just give you the regular Java class back. Uh, this is useful if you're calling APIs where you would uh, have to pass in a class. For example, where you used to pass in string.class, you would now pass in string class Java instead. And going back to this table, uh, there's a conspicuous spot in the bottom right that's blank. Of course, there is also something called k-type, uh, which is very similar to type, but it's the Kotlin equivalent. Uh, one difference here is that while type needed its subtype parameterized type to um, describe things that have parameters, K-type just supports this natively. Uh, it calls it different things. It has different property names. Uh, it calls the containing type classifier, and then that can have uh, some number of argument types. And K-type, of course, uh, because it's a Kotlin reflection concept, can also tell you whether a type is nullable, for example, um, as that's a core part of the Kotlin language. OK, armed with the knowledge of all of these different things uh, in reflection, let's now go back and try to look for a type to pass in. So this is the code that we were looking at. We have a reified t type parameter, and we want to get a type here. Um, based on what we've learned, we are able to do this, which is going to be valid code. So we're going to get a k class. We're going to convert that into a class. And we already know that a class is a type. So this code compiles and will work. Um, notably, we can all, only get this uh, class out of the type parameter because it is reified. Otherwise, this code wouldn't make sense because, uh, well, the compiler would not allow you to write it down. But also, if it did allow you to compile this, you would just get the object class every time. So this only works since the type parameter is reified. Uh, with this solution, uh, we can just run our tests to see that if it actually worked. Again, I am copy pasted the entire module when I was doing this. So I'm going to start with the JSON-based test and just quickly rename everything that was JSON to Moshi like that. And uh, now we're using the new Moshi implementation. But the actual test code is the same. We're creating a model, putting it into the crate, reading it back, asserting on it. Um, and if we do this with a simple value, the test will pass. And if we check our other test as well, where we are trying to store and restore a list of models, that test is going to fail. So something is not quite right with our Moshi-based implementation, even though it usually works. Here's the error that the test produces. It tells us that we were expecting to get a list of our own test model objects, like this. But we actually got a list of some other objects that also have the exact same data in them, but are not our own test models. So 
what are these, <laughs> you might ask. Uh, and it's very easy to figure this out by just going to the debugger. Um, if you do that, you're going to see that uh, what we got back are a list of linked hash tree maps, which are a wonderful Moshi type name. Um, the point is that this is a map, and this is the same phenomenon that we saw with JSON. Uh, we didn't accurately tell Moshi what to give us, so it gave us this very general um, way of thinking about JSON, which is just ne uh, nested maps and lists. So why did this happen? Uh, this is the code that we were using. Uh, more specifically, this is the part where we were uh, creating the type that we were passing in. We had two tests. One of them passes. One of them is failing. And uh, the in the first case, if we evaluate that expression on the top, we would get a class that accurately describes our test model. But in the second case, if we do the same, we only get a class that points to Java util list. So we're since class does not support parameterized types, we're only telling Moshi to give us a list of things, and it doesn't know what to serialize when it is populating the list. So it just puts uh, very general objects inside it. So this approach doesn't work. Uh, what else can we do? Um, surely Moshi supports uh, serializing lists of things somehow, and there are, like, must be APIs for this. And here's one of those APIs. Um, there is this new parameterized type function in Moshi where you could pass in list, jo list class Java and test model class Java, and it would construct a type that describes a list of test models. Uh, and if you were to give this to Moshi, it would correctly uh, do the serialization. But we can't really do that when we only have a generic type parameter because like, it just like doesn't work syntactically. Uh, we have to pass in two things here, but we only have the p type parameter. And we can't expect, uh, can't uh, inspect it uh, to see uh, what it contains uh, like this. And it might not be a nested type at all. It might be a list of list of strings or something. So uh, th these kinds of API calls just don't really fit our use case. Well, uh, what else we can do, um, try here? Uh, we could go back to this. Uh, we could add JSON as a dependency again, but we really, really don't want to do this. So what I ended up doing uh, was that I looked at the implementation of type token because I was hoping to be able to copy paste just that single class from JSON into my library and use it like that. So let's take a look at what type token is and what this syntax actually means and what it does. So here's a simplified version of type token. And uh, we're going to go through this uh, to understand uh, what it does to actually produce a type with this like really weird looking syntax. So first, we're creating an anonymous object, which is a subclass of type token. Uh, for this, it has a protected constructor so that we can call it when we're subclassing it. Uh, then we're reading the type property of this new object. And this is computed using this get superclass type parameter uh, function inside um, the type token class. And as you can see, uh, we're calling get class here to pass in a parameter to that function. and Notably, this get class call will give us a class that's describing our own anonymous object that we're creating. So this class is not describing type token. It's describing the type token subclass that we've created in our own code, uh, hence the parameter name subclass in the function, by the way. And really, all of the magic that JSON is doing here is on the very first line of the method. Uh, it's calling ge uh, get generic superclass on that class descriptor. Uh, let's take a look at what that is. Um, if you read the documentation, uh, this method returns a type representing the direct superclass of the entity represented by this class. So this is going to be a type object that describes the type token base class that we're extending with our current anonymous object. Uh, what's more is that if the superclass is parameterized, this type object will actually reflect the type parameters used in the source code. So this means that we're going to get a type here, which refers to type token, but it will also have the concrete value of the parameter in it. And the way that this works is that if it's non-parameterized, it's going to give us a class, which of course doesn't support generics. And if it is parameterized, we're going to get a parameterized type back. And this is all that the rest of the method here handles. It makes a check uh, to make sure that we didn't manage to create a type token with no type parameter, in which case we would get a class back. Uh, this is not possible in Kotlin, and you shouldn't do it in Java because it doesn't make sense for this uh, class. And after that, we now know that we must have a proper parameterized type. So we're just grabbing its list of type arguments, getting the first one, and returning that. 
Um, so that's going to be the actual real value of t represented uh, as a type. Of course, this is still wrapped in this canonicalized call inside the JSON library. And I didn't include the code of this method here, but it references four or five other JSON classes, which then reference other things in JSON. So uh, by trying to copy paste all of this, you would end up copy pasting most of JSON into your uh, code. Uh, the good news, though, is that this returns a type that's functionally equal to the parameter that it received. It just uh, transforms it into a slightly different implementation um, based on JSON's own needs. And so we can actually just drop this in our own usage. So we have this 10-line type token stolen from JSON, which will work correctly. Of course, this is Java code, and we're not about to add this to our project. So you can convert it to Kotlin uh, quite easily. Uh, this is the same code with Kotlin syntax. And there's still the matter of this syntax being really ugly. Uh, so to go from a reified T type to uh, having a type descriptor for it, you have to do this workaround of subclassing something and reading a property out of that. Um, it's just not nice syntax. So we can simplify this by just pulling most of this code into a reified function, uh, a reified type parameter inline function, and just creating a type token inside there and doing the rest of the things that we were looking at before. So with this, the use site, instead of that weird type token thing, just becomes uh, calling the make type function and passing in t to it as long as it's reified. So with that, we are done. Uh, we have a working implementation for MoshiPref. We're using make type for it. And if we were to run our tests again, it would now actually work for any arbitrary nesting. Uh, this is not quite done. Um, so as I've uh, managed to put this function together, uh, which took us from a reified type parameter to a type, I've discovered that there's something really, really similar in the Kotlin standard library called type of. Uh, so again, this is a function with no parameters, but a reified uh, type parameter, which gives you a K type. Uh, of course, this wouldn't work directly in the place of my own function uh, because it's returning a K type and I need a Java type instead. But there's also this extension, which brings you from a K type to a type, just like you could go from a K class to a class. Uh, so if you do this, uh, then you would now get back to the same place as I was doing with my type token hack. Of course, I run the tests again and they were failing. Uh, they told me that Java type is not supported for types created with create type. So I was like, okay, but what is create type? Uh, like, what do you mean? Um, so it turned out that that's just some function that type of eventually called into to actually create that K type implementation. And it very explicitly contained this error message. So it, it, it was clear that they didn't want you converting these K types back into a regular type uh, at all. So this was, I believe, in Kotlin 1.3. And I ended up giving up here, and I shipped the uh, Crate the Moshi uh, integration for Crate using uh, this make type uh, function that I've created based on type token. Then in Kotlin 1.4, things have changed. Uh, and this syntax became available again. And it actually started working uh, because type of was re-implemented as a compiler intrinsic thing. and um, it was still experimental. So in order to use this, I did have to opt into using experimental APIs in the standard library. But I could now use this and delete all of those 10 lines of code uh, that I created based on JSON. Type of is still experimental uh, to this day. Um, in Kotlin 1.6, this is supposed to be one of the features that finally becomes stable. It doesn't seem like a very important or very popular feature, uh, but there are some cases, uh, mostly when you're uh, dealing with types directly, like serialization or dependency injection or things like that, where it's really useful to be able to um, grab types like this. Um, so here's hoping that in six months or so, uh, this actually becomes stable. OK, uh, that's a wrap for the talk. Uh, I'm going to have a bunch of resources on the next slide uh, behind the link, uh, but I want to point out some of the things that are going to be there. So of course, I would recommend checking out both of these libraries. One of them is my own library, and the other one is Moshi, which you should be using uh, unless you need multi-platform support for your serialization needs. Uh, then I've given other talks about uh, both of these libraries, as I mentioned already, uh, which you can check out. And I've just done a bunch of library development things uh, recently. Um, so I also encourage you to take a look at that. And that's a wrap for today. You can find all of that and the slides and a lot more on that link. 
And if you're somehow not following me on Twitter yet and you want to hear about Android and Kotlin stuff, you can find me there as well.